Welcome to American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. This week, a look behind the headlines at the group many believe gave Donald Trump his presidential win. It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. The election of Donald Trump sent pollsters and demographers scrambling to determine the answer to this question. Who voted for Donald Trump? Was there just one demographic group responsible for his surprise victory? Or is the answer not so simple? One thing is for sure, there is a deep divide in this country between the haves and the have-nots. And to some degree, that divide was reflected in this election. Over the past year, the Miller Center has been gathering experts to give nonpartisan advice about major issues certain to confront the nation in the first year of this new presidency. There may be no issue bigger or more urgent than anxieties about the economic future of working class Americans. One way to better understand all this is to look at unemployment. That must be good news, right? Because unemployment currently stands at 4.7%. But is that really the complete story? Our guest in this episode says it's not. He argues that the U.S. has suffered something akin to a decimation of its male workforce over the past 50 years, that we are short of full employment by nearly 10 million male workers. Nicholas Eberstadt is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, the Washington think tank better known as AEI. His most recent book is Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis. Previously, he wrote A Nation of Takers, America's Entitlement Epidemic. Let's uh, talk right off the bat about those unemployment numbers that sure. I just cited. How can it be that an unemployment rate of 4.7%, which is a huge improvement over what it was seven years ago, uh, there's no, no disputing that, but you say that the idea that President Trump inherited a solid economy or that things are going generally in the right direction, I think you've said that's nonsense. So how can that be? Um, if we were still living in a Dickensian universe where there were only two options when you were of working age, either to have a job or to be looking for one, then the employment rate would be a perfect indicator of distress. Uh, but things aren't that simple anymore. There are now three statuses that you can have if you're of working age. You can either have a job, you can be unemployed and looking for a job, or you can be checked out from the workforce altogether. And over the past 50 years, the very fastest growing segment of so-called working age uh, men uh, has been the out of labor force, unworking, neither working nor looking for work guys. For every guy today in that prime group you mentioned, who's unemployed, there are three who are neither working nor looking for work. So if you just look at the unemployment rate, you're chasing the wrong rabbit for every male yep. in that prime working group, yep. so we're not talking about high school kids or college kids nope. or retirees, nope. um, but uh, these, these, these men who are in that 25 year period. That Critical you're... age group, backbone of the labor force, the ones that the labor economists and the uh, people on Wall Street always look at. Uh, for every guy who is formally unemployed, there are three guys who are neither working nor looking for work, so they're out of the equation altogether that unemployment is calculated on the basis of. Yeah, fascinating. Now, President Trump, uh, there, there was a, a stir of, uh, of reaction when President Trump has said a number of times in different ways he has, has thrown out gigantic numbers saying, oh, the real unemployment <clears throat> of the country is vast and often is this much higher number than the official numbers. Sure. And the reaction to that typically has been, oh, he's counting uh, all sure. of these categories that shouldn't be counted. Sure. But, but so your number, though, that you're talking about is yeah. not the same as what he's saying. No. no, no. What I'm trying to do is an apples to apples comparison that lets us take a look at what's happened over time and over historical time. And if you take a look, let's say, only at the people who are employed, only at the people with jobs, employment to population ratio or work rate, okay? The work rate for these 25 to 54 year old American men is lower today than it was in 1940, at the tail end of the depression. So it's not hyperbolic to say that this is a depression scale <laughs> crisis for 
working age men. Why then are we not in a depression-like environment? Why doesn't it feel right. like we're in a depression? Uh, we're a vastly more affluent society than we were in 1940, and in fact, even since the year 2000, net wealth in the United States has more than doubled. So. Some people have a whole lot of good times going on. Uh, we also have women in the workforce in a way that clearly wasn't the case uh, back before World War II. One of the big stories for all Western economies in the post-war era was the entry of women into paid work. I mean, women always work. It's just that after World War II, they got paid for it. Yeah. And that's, that's been... Uh, important factor there. Yeah, and so, and the men then that we're talking about who are not working, and particularly those who are not seeking work, um, if we try to figure out who they are, yeah. uh, and so the, I mean, some of them are just, they're just not working, right? They're just, uh, they're, they're at home watching TV, right? Well, about one in seven of this seven million pool you mentioned say they're out of the labor force because they can't find work. That's the classic definition of a discouraged worker. But the overwhelming majority do not say that it's because of want of employment, that there's other reasons that they give. Some of those other uh, men out of the workforce are adult students. They're basically pursuing uh, education as if it were a job. That are ready to get back into the game. But there's an enormous group, many, many millions, who are in what the Brits would call NEET, N-E-E-T, neither employed nor in uh, education and training. And that's a group which is in absolute, I think, desolation and despair today. Mm. And they're also not, uh, I mean, it may be that the reason they're not starving is because uh, there is another person in their unit, and probably a wife or a woman uh, who they're not married to, but it's somebody who does have an income of some sort, uh, and that's why they're not in even more desperate straits. But these men are not necessarily uh, watching the kids, or sort of, it's not a complete reversal of roles, it's uh, but but it, the critical thing is that there is a another person in this family, probably a woman, who's actually working. It's almost necessarily that they're not watching the kids. I mean, it, there is an astonishing care chasm between women who are not in the labor force and men who are not in the labor force. The men who are not in the labor force and say they're at home because they're watching kids or somebody else is almost a rounding error. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it approximates mm -hmm. zero. So so when we when you survey these very people and you say, well, what are you doing? You know, when you're not working, there's not half of them saying, yeah. I'm helping, I'm taking care of the kids and getting the laundry done. No, they don't say that. It's, it's, really, um, it, it's really distressing to see the self-reported answers on what uh, the guys who are out of the labor force, neither in employment, education, or training, do with their time. Yeah. They basically say they don't do civil society. They don't uh, attend religious uh, worship. They don't do charitable work. Uh, they're not part of civil society. Uh, what they say they do is watch. They say they watch TV, they say they watch internet, handheld devices, as if it were a full-time uh, job. 2,100 hours a year is what they report. And there's one, uh, one data point here that, um, uh, that about half of these men from surveys indicate that they took painkillers the previous day. Or, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Alan Kruger at Princeton uh, published a study last year that reported this. So it's not just spending all day watching TV, it's spending all day watching TV stoned. Wow. I mean, your work is, is fundamentally about the working class, but are there racial d distinctions within this that, that have some sort of meaningful uh, uh, um, some usefulness? Sure. Well, I mean, if you're talking about a group of seven million guys, you obviously have pretty much some of everybody in it. Mm -hmm. But there are, uh, there are people who are overrepresented. Uh, African Americans are overrepresented. Guys with less education, especially guys without a high school degree, are overrepresented. Uh, guys who've never been married are overrepresented. And interestingly enough, guys who are born in America as opposed to being immigrants are overrepresented. That's true for every ethnic group within the composition. But it is, some of these things are cross-cutting. For instance, if you are a, a white guy uh, who's never been married, you're more likely to be in this pool than a black guy who's married. Uh, workforce participation rates for African American guys who are married are higher than for white guys who've never been married. Mm. So there's some individual agency in this also. If we look at these numbers, 
if you showed them to a group of uh, to African Americans mm -hmm. and you said, "Hey, look at this. Here's a phenomenon where," and you and if you separated out the mm -hmm. white guys in this group, and you said, "Look at this entrenched phenomenon mm -hmm. that has developed with these white male workers uh, and these higher than you would expect levels mm -hmm. of unemployment and you know, mm -hmm. these kinds of behaviors um, and the frustrations that they feel," I think a lot of African Americans would say, "Welcome to the club." Sure. You, yeah, you know, we've been this is what we've been stuck in or versions of this for a very very long time. And so this is something that I sometimes think about as the democratization of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea that we're, we once were a society that had sort of designated the black people, which were then the only major minority, but that sort of black people were the permanent underclass. And as the system became more fair, in a mm -hmm. sense, that what we've actually done is extend the, 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 the dimensions of our economy and our society that that seem to create this vulnerability, mm -hmm. well, that's now something that the white males are subject to, not just African Americans. Is there any logic to that? I, I think there's an immense amount of logic to that. I mean, you recall that back about half a century ago, a little bit more than half a century ago, uh, the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan did this then electric, uh, electrifying report uh, in language of those days, the Negro family in America, a case for national action about black family, disintegration in America. He was absolutely alarmed because it turned out that at that time about one in four uh, African American children was being raised in a single parent home. I mean, today for Anglos, for non-Hispanic whites, the proportion of children born out of marriage is almost 30% is higher than what alarmed Moynihan about African American community in America half a century ago. When he wrote that report, he thought that the unique uh, oppression that African Americans had suffered would explain the family breakdown. It turned out instead that African Americans were just sort of a leading indicator for things that were going to be happening to the rest of America over the decades after that. The uh, family disintegration, increasing welfare dependence, crime to some degree, uh, but a leading indicator, uh, very much a part of society, but a leading indicator, not an exceptional group. If you look at West Virginia, you'll see that that state has got the highest proportion of men of working ages not employed of any state in the nation. No surprise for the reasons that you've mentioned. But what we see across the country over the past generation is that the gaps between different states in the U.S., uh, the work rates of different states, are getting more and more disparate. I mean, when I took uh, economics back in the Stone Age, they told me that that uh, labor markets tended to equalize over time. We're seeing exactly the opposite occurring in the U.S., and I don't think you can explain that just in terms of uh, technological change, uh, globalization. There are other things that are going on. Maybe we're not, you know, maybe we're not attuned to them as well as we should be. And, and what are those? I mean, are we talking about work ethic, sort of? Uh, 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 I'll, I'll mention two things. I'll mention two things because I think the government does a really rotten job of tracking both of these. Uh, one is the explosion of uh, disability insurance payments as an alternative to working life in America today. Living on disability sure isn't a great lifestyle. It's not going to make you live like a prince but more and more people are in this disability financed lifestyle. At this point, about three out of five of those prime age men are uh, receiving one or more disability pension. Um, the second thing that we don't talk much about is uh, the criminalization or criminality of the U.S. population. We talk about mass incarceration, and we know that there are millions and millions of men behind bars. What we don't seem to pay any attention to is that there are vastly more men who have been sentenced, who have been felonized, 
in our society as, as a whole than behind bars. At this point in time, there are probably about 20 million American men and women, obviously mostly men, who have a felony in their background and are not behind bars. That's one out of eight guys in America today. The government kind of forgot to collect any information about this, so the government can't tell you what their work profiles are lot like. But that's got to be one of the reasons the U.S. Uh, work profile and labor force participation profile is so much more disappointing than in other rich countries today. We're stuck, I think, most Americans are stuck on a view of society uh, about who's performing and who's not. Uh, There's sort of an early 70s picture, and it's a picture that says lots of African American men uh, are not in the workforce and maybe aren't trying to work and maybe are living <laughs> off uh, living off a woman, maybe they, uh, some sort of government entitlement is the, the key element of their equation, and not marrying, lots of African American children being born out of wedlock, and and teenage African-American girls uh, having way too many babies. And that's kind of the stereotypical picture, and we see that as things that are largely uh, located in the African-American community. But if you look at the recent data, of course, what you see is that uh, the, you know, Teen pregnancy among African American mm -hmm. girls has you know fallen precipitously over the last ten years. Fastest rising group being incarcerated. Uh, I think the fastest growth is actually just off of such a small base are actually white females. But the, but but also all these numbers of the declining performance of yeah. white males. Yeah. The. Uh the big story of social dysfunction in the last uh, 10 or 15 years may be the Anglo, the non-Hispanic white heroin epidemic and painkiller epidemic. Uh, when, uh, when I was my children's age, if you talked about people who were addicted to opioids, it was a ghetto minority stereotype. Uh, What's happened over the last 20 years is that uh, painkiller and heroin addiction has gone mainstream, main street, and it's been and it's grown disproportionately among the so-called Anglo population, which is why deaths from uh, uh, overdoses, different types of overdoses, can now on a national scale be higher than deaths from traffic accidents or gunshots. Uh, this, and this is a this is a white thing. Yeah, that's astonishing, really. Uh, the, and but it's also weird. You know, it's it's strange though. It's astonishing, but it's also, uh, you know, in. in it's that our society has become more fair. <laughs> uh, and really terrible things now are now more fairly distributed. E equal opportunity to disaster. Well, one of the things which has happened over the last 15 or 20 years, which I think is quite eerie, has been the end of health progress for the Anglo population in America and the rise in death rates for less educated whites. Uh, Ann Case and Angus Deaton, both at Princeton, did a stunning study a couple of years ago documenting this. And why are death rates rising for less educated white men and women between 45 and 54 when they're uh, improving more or less everywhere else in the world? Uh, suicide, uh, poisoning, uh, read overdoses, uh, and cirrhosis of the liver. These are deaths of despair. It's heartrending. But, but even beyond that, what are, the, you know, what are the big implications of this for society? Sure. Um, since the year 2000, uh, personal wealth in our country has more than doubled. And over that same period of time, the bottom has dropped out in the labor force. If we had the same work rates today as in the year 2000, we'd have 10 million more people in America with paid work. So we live in this era when there's more wealth for the wealth holders and less work for the workers. I mean, if you wanted to set the stage for a populist storm, I don't know how you could do much better than that. But does that mean that if these trends continue, uh, we ultimately consume that, you know, that wealth? Certainly it is true that if the economy picks up, and we have had a, uh, I suppose the charitable word for it is mediocre economy since about the year 2000. If the economy picks up, it's going to bring back some of the men and now the women because the work rates have started to drop for women as well since the year 2000. It'll bring some of them back. But there are other people that I don't think are going to be rescued just by the miracle of the market. These are the people who are trapped in the disability uh, 
support lifestyle, who've gotten into Medicaid financed uh, painkiller addiction, uh, people who have the felonies in their background. I think we're going to have to do something that actually suggests that they matter to us if we're going to try to bring them back into the rest of society. What would that look like, the, a kind of response that, uh, that, would, that might change this, whether it's actually repairing the mm -hmm. broken people who are currently broken, <clears throat> or even if it's just how do we make sure. this population not get any bigger, how do we make the next sure. generation better? Um, is the solution what President Trump is talking about? In, uh, tariffs at the border, um, uh, you know, the, you, is it his recipe yeah. or is it something else? Well, my uh, personal tragic dis disability is that I was trained in economics. And uh, what I learned in economics was that if you want to get rid of all of the rest of the manufacturing jobs, you might as well have a great big trade war right now, because that'll do it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a way that everybody loses. I think what we need to do is get the escalator moving again. I mean, the escalator is working pretty well for one stratum of America, but it's obviously not working for a whole lot of other Americans. And um, I don't have the 10-point uh, the program or the 12-step program or whatever we talk about for that to, to make this happen, but I can see we clearly need to have uh, more uh, generation of jobs by smaller businesses. Small businesses are the heart and soul of job generation in America. We've lived in a net business death environment since about the year 2007, more businesses closing than opening. We need to have a lot more mobility. The churning is good, not bad. The churning is good. Leaving jobs and going to new jobs is good. That's mobility. We've got less geographic and also labor force mobility than we had 30 years ago. We've got to do something about this trap of disability insurance. We need to have a reform that leads to a work first principle in, uh, in social welfare policy. And finally, we can't, we can't pretend that the 20 million Americans in our country who have trouble with the law sometime uh, don't exist. Uh, we're supposed to be a forgiving society. If people have paid their debt to society, we've got to figure out how to get them back in society and back in the economy. We can't have evidence-based policies if we don't have the evidence and the government's closing its eyes towards these 20 million people. I know you say you don't have the, you know, the 10 point plan, but is it basic stuff like that? Is it going back to education uh, or? Well, there's, there's some things that the government can't do. I mean, the government can't repair the American family and family structure matters immensely to social and economic outcomes. We don't know how to do that. I mean, maybe if there were some sort of uh, John Wesley style awakening in America, that could make some sort of a big difference. But I sure wouldn't want the government to have the Department of Methodism, right? I mean, you don't, you don't want to have something like that. Um, what the government can do is with education. And uh, educational attainment improvement in our country has stalled. It stalled for more than a decade. It stalled for a couple of decades. And the quality of uh, K through 12 education in America, I think, might charitably be described as mixed at the moment. Uh, not everybody needs to go to college, but everybody needs a skill. And we need to have a system of education, not just for the kids who are in school, but also for people of uh, current working age, that. Uh, replenishes or enhances their skills because it's the skills which are going to be the key to the escalator, I think. Mm. So if, uh, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to give your best advice to President Trump directly yet, uh, but by if- Twitter? <laughs> by Twitter or any other means. I don't use Twitter. <laughs> if, um, but if you had the chance, um, if, if, uh, if it so happened that President Trump in the middle of the night watched this, the, the, the show that we've taped today uh, and said, okay, I want to actually talk to that guy um, and called you in and you had 10 minutes or even less than 10 minutes, but basically Donald Trump said, okay, what's the, you, you know, you're, you're such a smart guy. Yeah. Uh, you tell me, where do I start in terms of dealing with this group of people, a lot of whom did vote for me uh, and who, but whose lives I actually do want to change. I want to see different. What's the first thing you would say to him either as a, here's where you're going wrong or here's the thing you really ought to be doing? I guess the very first thing that I'd say is look at the 20 million invisibles. Uh, 
get the numbers that you need to see how the 20 million invisible people with the uh, felonies in their backgrounds are doing to get, help them re-enter society. If I was able to get to the second floor in the elevator conversation, then I'd uh, talk about reforming disability insurance. And if we had another floor, uh, revitalizing small business in the United States. This is a conversation that um, that's almost always the case. It's a lot more complicated than we want it to be uh, uh, in understanding any of these issues and understanding things as basic as why somebody won a particular election. Uh, but I think this kind of insight into a group of people that it's true, whether we're in a bubble or not, that most Americans kind of just don't want to hear about. If, you're, if they're not part of it, uh, just don't want to hear about this. Uh, and that's a long pattern in American history of, uh, of us just not wanting to, to hear about a problematic cohort of the population. So thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. We hope you'll join us for future editions of American Forum, where our focus is always on the presidency and the challenges it faces. Coming up in future episodes, Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz and Bill Clinton speechwriter, now citizen power activist, Eric Liu. You can watch us on your local public television affiliate or to join our ongoing conversation, look for us on the Miller Center Facebook page, visit millercenter.org or follow us on Twitter. My handle is at Douglas Blackman. See you next week.